I call this meeting to order. Um, if you would follow along with the <coughs> allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, can we get a roll call, please? Fenton. Here. Denham. Cooper. Here. Milton. Here. Howden, Rodriguez, Here. LeBlanc. Here. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you. Well, on our agenda is a discussion regarding our short-term rentals, and we will get a report from Ben Hart and Mark. Ben, what you got for us? Thank you, Mayor. And Chad's going to pull over the PowerPoint. There we go. So one of the issues that we talked about last year a little bit in a budget process, uh, one of the big rocks, if you will, was short-term rentals, uh, but a certain, to a certain degree. And really, it, it centered around identifying all the short-term rental uh, units we have in the city. That was, I think, the original intent. And as uh, Matthew and I got to talking about it more and more, more and more questions kept coming up, and it spilled over into zoning issues. So what Mark and I thought it would, it would be helpful was to really provide some education, if you will, to the public really clarification of what we do, what finance does, what uh, planning does when it comes to short-term rentals and licensing and what's out there. And then kind of introduce some of those uh, some of those challenges that we do have. Now, most of the challenges we we're able to, at least on the finance side, we're able to provide some solutions to. So I'm going to clarify some of that. Uh, but there's others out there that we're going to obviously going to need the governing body's uh, uh, ideas or, or backing on. We just need to be able to talk about some of those issues. Uh, because staff can't make, obviously, those, legislate those decisions. Uh, so that's what we're going to do tonight. So we're splitting this into two, two uh, uh, sides, the finance side and planning side. Before I get started, though, all of our licenses go through Matthew Henry. Him and his staff process, and we'll see it here in a minute, processes thousands of documents a year just in license and tourism tax itself. And we'll go through So I just, he's here just in case uh, I mess something up, he could throw something at me. And, and not worry about it. Um, so uh, within finance, uh, there's two things that we do, obviously, amongst when it comes to license and tourism tax. We issue all licenses, and we also collect all tourism tax. Tourism tax comes to the city different than like a sales tax. We actually get collect the tourism tax. Sales tax goes through the state and then comes to us. Uh, licenses get issued for these uh, these items here on the, under the bullets, uh, and then the tourism taxes that are coming off we'll, we'll get on each one of these items here. Uh, what the license, the licensing is actually legislated by our code, and this just shows a couple of those pieces of code. The italics part shall not operate a business within the city without first having obtained a valid license or, or permit. That's the key, the heart of that piece of the code. One of the others, this 22-30 is going to come up a little later. Separate license required for each address in which of operation is, is being done. Typical on a, a retail operation, you've got one location. Or maybe two if you get two Walmarts, right? So you've got two locations. Um, but this is going to come up here in a minute when we're, we're addressing short-term rentals as well. Uh, there are certain requirements before we obtain, anybody obtains a business license, obviously. There are certain state requirements being registered with the state, not just registered with the Secretary of State, but also the uh, retail sales license. They've got to have a license and be able to present that to us. And then proof of insurance on a few items uh, that, that we collect or verify that's there. Um, other requirements, we sit down and talk to them if, if it applies uh, about tourism tax bonds uh, and, and tourism tax remittance forms. We make sure that they have the right form and they know where it's at to be able to pull it down and, and use it. Uh, that's before we issue a license. Now, I'm going to touch on liquor license because a lot of this is still applicable for our business license. So this is probably the most complicated one where we require a lot a lot more information. Um, the certificate of good standing and articles of incorporation just make sure they're a business. They've got a city business license, at least the paper, ready to file it. 
application fee and background report from the highway patrol. That's actually required by the liquor license. Um, we review uh, or approval of any kind of city liquor control specialist. If there's been issues in the past, we need to get them solved. Payment of past due and current taxes, sales tax, tourism tax, property tax. In order to get a business license approved, an actual business license, you've got to be current on all your taxes. And we look e each one of those up. So if you got a if you got a, a Clay Cooper coming in that's always on time, we could look him up and know that he's always paid his taxes. See how that works? I do too. <laughs> uh, he may not be registered to vote, but we'll figure that out too. The, uh, we. Get a driver's license, obviously photo ID for the liquor license, so we can kind of tie that back to who, who's running the property. Um, uh, we look at the lease of the rental agreements for the locations itself, and then obviously that certificate of naturalization, if it's applicable. Um, and that's for uh, new citizens coming in. Um, so submitted to the, to the city after the issuance of the state liquor license, this is what we typically get each one of these. Payment of tourism taxes is where it comes in uh, for any, for due to the city for any service. That's water and sewer that's provided to the city. So we can look up an address and see what, what all is required, what payments are required to be settled out. And, and that includes any kind of payment plan that they might be on. That's something that we can check on. Uh, and then the liquor license is also issued by the state and we make sure that they have one. Uh, and then the payment of any kind of fees when it comes to liquor license. Once all of that is satisfied and they've completed a business license uh, for us and we've received the payment, obviously uh, we'll issue the license, but once they've been able to schedule the inspections with fire, building, and health. This is one of the issues that came up when we started talking about short-term rentals. Uh, business owner calls for the fire inspections, for the fire and building inspections. They get it all set up, right? So we get that information back before we actually issue that business license. Once everything, all the inspections are done and they're complete and the requirements have been met, we can issue that license. Um, that, that's kind of the process, a quick overview. A couple of the important pieces is, are uh, we go ahead and check if they owe the city anything, we make sure that that's been paid or agreed upon. So that's <coughs> always done, whether it's tourism tax, sales tax, you name it, we got to make sure that they've paid it. The And then the inspections have to be done and that's coordinated between Matthew and, and uh, Mark and then the fire department as well. They've got to get, get each one of those done. Some of the challenges uh, that we obviously run into, uh, for the business license, we're talking about 3,000 applications a year. Uh, these get sent out, as in paper copies get sent out uh, to each of the business for new renewals. There's others that are new businesses that come in uh, that need to get licensed. As far as the tourism tax, we get a thousand, approximately a thousand tourism tax returns a month. This is all paper. Now we look at the short-term rentals, STR, you'll hear that a lot. 900 STR units registered per year, and that's 450 individual licenses. So we may have a licensee that has 10 different properties or 10 different units, which could be 10 different properties for that matter. So what? this is really a workload measure, so what are we doing about it? We just offered uh, uh, a job to a licensed compliance specialist to help uh, to help work through some of these issues with Matthew and Mark. Um, so we've had that digitizing a lot of the applications and document submissions. We've also cleaned up some of the code, make it more uh, applicable to what we're doing now, and then cleaned up the code to where it makes it easier to do business with the, the city of Branson. Uh, so you're not, for instance, you don't have to submit a return on tourism tax every month for $2. We can, we can make some of that stuff work. And Matthew continues to look at uh, those type of things. Before, so that, that's really the workload measures we've got. Before you move on, Go ahead. Um, are we taking steps to digitize all of these applications and returns instead of doing them, mailing the piece of paper, Absolutely. Going up, mailing it back, going right. through the mail? Right. And, and what we're wanting to do, well, through the new ERP system, it, she has been able to help us bring yeah. in yeah. It is going to be a lot of that process. Now, that's not something that's going to happen in 23 or 24. It's staged in a process that also includes planning. Uh, but the idea is to be able to get that information from our website 
or at a terminal, if you will, right there on site if you don't have a laptop or a, another access to it. You can actually apply for your business license right there and submit all your documents. You can do it over the counter as well. That's not going to change. But what we're trying to do is drive a lot of the business to the website, and that way, that way there's not as much labor, if you will. Give us your email address. We'll email you the form next time for renewal. I mean, when I renew my 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 uh, tags on my truck, I don't get a paper copy. I get a text actually. This is ready to go. I hit a, hit OK, and that state site comes up. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that we're looking at, and that obviously brings down a lot of the labor costs. Oh sure, that's that's a lot of paper. Okay, thank you. Um, ensuring all the STUs are reg registered and remitting uh, tourism taxes. This is the rock that came up last year. It, how do we identify those? Um, well, one, we make sure that there's, the ones we do have are still collecting tourism tax or sales tax uh, payments, and they're verified before any kind of renewal are happening. Uh, the idea of a software or professional service actually came up last year. Uh, and that can be expensive, but uh, one of the reasons we kind of put it off, or I put it off, was to actually get the manpower to actually help put something like that in place. So the idea here is we're going to go ahead and issue, if the board is okay with that, we're going to issue an RFP or an RFQ just to get information about what's out there that we can use to identify short-term rentals. It may be software, it may be a professional service. It just really depends on what, what, is, what information can we gather that would help us do this. Because we gotta believe there's more than 900 units in Branson. Yeah, so what are you needing to be able to move that forward? I'm really a head nod that we can issue the RFP. And we're gonna draft that and bring it back to Kathy. That yeah. way she can see it before, and <laughs> make sure what we're doing is the right thing. That would be the steps on that. Thank you. Speed of business, we could give you a nod right now, but. <laughs> Um, so here, this, this actually, number three actually links back to what I talked about before. A business license for a single location. Right now, one business license for uh, a short-term rental company that may have 10 different locations, it's only one license. So if you think about it, if one location fails inspection, they can't get a license on any of them. If we have a license on each one of them, Maybe one failed, nine are good. Those nine are good to go. Let's figure out the one and the one. The one license on this one that didn't, didn't pass. Uh, that, that's the idea behind licensing for each one of the units. Our code doesn't allow that. I think address that at all right now, does it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it just never was. So enforcing, to, I guess enforcing it. For those listening, would you just repeat yeah, what so, Matthew said? Come on up. So, if you just went strictly by code, uh, where it talks in 22-30, there should be a separate license for every location. But for, yeah, it's for 15 or 20 years, it's just never been done that way. It was one nightly rental license, you're good to go. Now, back then, we hadn't seen the explosion of nightly rentals like we have in the last five years, so it was more manageable. But now, it's just such an issue, it's difficult to get control of. Wait, are you saying that the code does say that it's per location, it just hasn't been enforced? Right. Okay. And Matt, if I can jump in, if that's okay, Mayor, it's not just for short-term rentals either, is it? Right. It's also for um, hotels, motels, that that just hasn't been in consistently enforced? And so, uh, let's say like McDonald's, they've got multiple locations. They do have a license for every one. It's exclusively in the area of nightly rentals that's been treated this way. Mm -hmm. So just one license, but multiple locations all over the city covered under that. But just to go back to my point, but there's been mm -hmm. some motels that have also kind of... In the past, there, there were, and we're finding that as ownerships change and things yeah. like that. And we so we're, we're cleaning it up, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Does the... For, for a situation like that, somebody that has, say, 10 nightly rental units, does the cost of their application increase with the number of units? In other words, if we say you're going to license per unit versus you have one license with 10 units under that, is there a cost difference? 
Well, I just, I mean, what's, what's, in, what's it supposed to be? I know it's not been the case, but right. is there going to be a cost difference? So currently, all of our uh, licenses, the fee is based on number of employees. So since it's a nightly rental unit, zero to two employees is $50. So they just pay a $50 fee, whether you've got one unit or 100. That, so that's my point. So if you right. have one unit, you pay a $50 fee. And presently, we've allowed them to have 10, 15, 20, however many units under that one fee. But if we go to location licensing, then they would be doing that per, per unit. unit. Mm -hmm. The, the way the license is set up, it's, it's set up to attempt to recover some of those costs. So if you think about it, if, if, if I've got one license and I've got 10 different locations, I've got fire coming out to all 10 locations. But I'm only paying for one license. I'm giving him 50 bucks to go to all 10 lo locations. I guarantee you it costs more than 50 bucks to go all 10 of my locations. That's kind of the... So the Ted and them still have all that work and cost. We're just not... Not collecting near rid, the yeah. money. Yeah, and, and to address what you're getting at, right, some of the points that we've discovered as well is there are cities that go through a, a, a licensing cost process where it may be a sliding scale. Yeah. So 50 bucks or, well, it's not $50. They have a higher number for X number of units, right? So you get one company that may come in and have 1,000 different units. You're going to kind of talk about licenses. Yeah. You're not going to have 1,000 times 50 bucks. Yeah. You're going think, to start... I think that. that's because if we've been doing it this way for a number of years, and if you had even 100 units, yeah. and all of a sudden we're saying, well, you're going to pay, we're just going to flip a switch and you're going to pay 50 times 100. Yeah. I mean, I think for some Five people grand, that's... Yeah. I think a sliding scale, I think the scales, that's more yeah. than fair. And, yeah. yeah. And you're kind, of see, you're kind of seeing what some of that conversation has been like, at least in our office, as we've been talking about some of this stuff. So that single license, it's there right now, uh, and we can apply it toward each location, but then it brings up the cost, the, the, the part of the fees. In, in the current code, just it, the current code has the thought of one location or maybe two, never like 100 different locations, and then license all of them. It's just it doesn't contemplate that. So that's got to be thought through and brought back. Uh, for discussion. What about rental management companies? Are they are they required to get a business license? And if so, if we have a rental management company that has 100 units under them, is that going to be considered where you're managing 100 different locations? 100 different locations. So we've got companies that actually, they're, they're subscriber based. So the owners of the units actually subscribe to their service. They'll collect, they want to collect tourism tax, sale, not sales tax, but they want to collect the tourism tax. They want to file the license for all the locations, all in one spot. And it's just one company that comes in and does all that. But, yeah, they'd have to get a license for you still for each one of those locations that the, that the domicile is there. So the owner would have to get it and the, the owner or that again. subscriber. Whoever's in charge, actually. We would want the name of the owner or the contact person for that unit. Okay. In case fire comes out, they got to look up who owns this so we can get them a call because it's burning. The management company's not going to care. It's the owner of the... The, the units that are going to be, need to be identified. And we do require that. We need to name, know the name of each one of those. But it's just one person that pays yeah. it. Right. Think, it's either the manager or the owner. Or the owner. Right. right. They, just, they have to put down a name that we can, that's a contact name for those units. Right. And then lastly, the number of inspections required, and we kind of touched on this. It's really the volume of those has grown exponentially. Our, our, Tourism tax within short-term rentals has gone up 169% since 2019. Uh, here this year through June, we're up 8%, and that was on top of 32% last year. It's just, it's exploding. Yeah. And you can see in the news where cities are grappling with this explosion uh, in, in this type of business, good or bad, whether you agree to it or not, it's still workload is what it is. And, and how do you apply the current process to that? In this case, there's certain standards that need to be uh, reviewed. We, uh, on all the business license, we require sprinkler systems within a commercial entity, right? So if you convert a home to a uh, uh, short-term rental, are you going to have a sprinkler system throughout the entire house? Code, current code says, yes, you will. You'll need that. Um, that's kind of some of the discussion that we're going to continue to have with planning and, uh, and the group and fire. But that's out there as well. 
So those are the key challenges we've got right now within finance. Uh, and I know planning's got quite a bit more. And I'm going to let Mark come on up and talk about the rest of it. Go ahead, Mark. Well, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and lady and gentlemen of the board. So as Ben had pointed out, we had a great opportunity to chat through this. That's one of the key things that obviously the city, and not only the city of Branson, but all throughout the country we're dealing with. And you know, the city of Branson, as well as you know, any other entity within the state, has to deal with the Missouri Revised Statutes. There are several of them that specifically pertain to why we do some of the things that we do, and not necessarily that pertain or to deal with that specifically, but uh, for example, we're given the authority to do much of anything we do in the Planning and Development Department via uh, the, the, the revised statutes. Uh, the first highlighted specifically allows us to promote health, safety, morals, and the general welfare of the community, uh, um, as well as to do intake of fire department reviews. We have another statute that allows city councils to regulate the control and the construction of buildings, and then ultimately we also have another statute that allows communities to incorporate and by reference certain technical codes, which is a whole lot of reason why we decided to move forward with a lot of the building codes that we have. Um, so for example, um, in the city of Branson, we have adopted the international building code that deals with the construction of non-residential structures. Um, also lumped in there, which overlays that quite a bit, is the fire prevention code. So anytime you're dealing with uh, construction of buildings, you're certainly dealing with uh, fire piece and keeping people safe, which is whole th reason why we have some of the authorities that we do and then ultimately if it's a residential structure we would be dealing with the international residential code to uh, deal with uh, residential pieces of that. <coughs> so just to kind of outline one of the some of the things we have to do when we're dealing with permitting um, one thing I want to highlight and, and Ben started to highlight that was one of the reasons and we need to ask this and certainly we can get into the discussion in just a moment deeper but the question is, is if you look at the number of units that Ben highlighted, um, was it 900, and 900, resident, 900 units within the city, um, we'll look at some numbers here in a moment to see that that's you know, greatly inaccurate based on what we're seeing from other uh, avenues. But um, certainly we have to deal with the code and, and why are people not being compliant with being, getting a license and allowing people to uh, be within their facilities uh, under the proper licensing. And so those are some of the questions that we want to potentially be able to answer. And hopefully maybe we can do a start to uh, entertain an answer to that question going forward. But really, we, you know, when we go back into the code we have right now, chapter nine of four specifically is zoning. So we look at definitions. Um, I know definitions are going to be a key thing we're going to be looking at specifically tonight, but you know, going into the future. But um, you know, look specifically at short-term rental. What exactly is a short-term rental defined as? And our ordinance is fairly light when it comes to defining it. It specifically just says that it means any lodging or rental for a per period of 30 or less days. So you, you also have nightly rentals, which is a similar kind of a, a definition, a dwelling or portion thereof, which guest rooms are available to transient guests. And as you can see, it, it defines that a little bit deeper. Lodging establishments, as you can see, I'm not going to read it to you, but there's a much deeper definition for lodging establishments. Same thing with dwellings. So then you know, go back even to the nightly rental definition. Specifically means a dwelling or a portion thereof. So you start to wonder what actually is the definition of a dwelling. And most people assume that a dwelling is specifically residential, but that's going to be a key part of our discussion going forward. But then you know, one key caveat, and I want to use this as an example for some of the things that we have to deal with now and how we deal with it, is bed and breakfast and how those are specifically treated maybe a little bit differently or could be treated differently uh, than some of the other units within the city. So um, I'm, I'm definitely not going to read this, so, so um, you're more than welcome to look at this deeper later. But one thing we look at any time when we're looking at issuance of occupancy or certificates of occupancy uh, is looking at what type of uh, use that particular structure is going to be. So there's 10 main use categories, um, and as you can see, uh, they uh, have a whole variety of, you know, assembly, business, educational, factory and industrial, high hazard, institutional, mercantile, which is business, uh, residential, storage, and utility miscellaneous. And one key place will stay here, if you look at number eight, the residential piece, there's groups R1, R2, R3, and R4. And each one of those use groups um, 
defines the, you know, the amount of people that can be in any particular facility and some of the specific requirements as to how you define that. So breaking it down deeper, like for example, an R1 uh, would specifically deal with uh, primarily transient guests, people that include boarding houses, hotels, and motels. So that's like your typical rental unit. Uh, but then you obviously have some other key pieces. Like for example, an R3 is a residential occupancy where occupants are primarily permanent in nature and not classified as an R1 or an R2. Um, but then, so that's the main difference between an R1 and an R3, it's, is it transient or not? But then if you key in on R2, uh, it, it can specifically highlights that it contains sleeping units with uh, more than two dwelling units where the occupants are primarily permanent in nature. Um, but it does specifically highlight, as you can see, um, you know, congregate living facilities of 16 or fewer occupants. Um, so, um, and then R4 are actually um, more like living, care, living and assisted care units. So why I wanted to highlight that is um, you can start to look at what is actually required for each one of those typical units. Um, whenever you're looking at the code, um, an R1 will, as I mentioned previously, is primarily transient in nature. So one thing that I would like to look at is when we're going to try and answer that hypothetical question is why aren't people not being compliant? One thing that I speculate, and I think there's a lot of reasons why that is, is that you know, if you're going to convert, for example, a unit from a, a single family dwelling to a re rental unit, um, you now need to comply with certain ones of our codes. And one of the biggest ones is fire sprinkling. Uh, there's also obviously uh, fire alarm systems. But as you can understand, if you have a residential unit, um, it's not designed for the weight for um, for some of those things. It's not designed for uh, the walls potentially have the space, the, the carrying capacities of the, the spaces to actually install those particular uh, fire suppression systems. So um, it could be very, very expensive for somebody to immediately need to convert their unit to that. And a lot of times what you'll, you're, you're seeing is some older homes that were definitely not designed uh, to hold a fire sprinkling system. So a lot of the times it's literally just a financial decision by the person that wants to rent the unit out. It, you know, is it uh, cost prohibitive to now convert your unit and install the fire sprinkling or fire alarm systems? Um, so, you know, you want to look at you know, some of the key details and maybe are, are breaking down how to specifically look at that. So, um, as I mentioned, R1 primarily transient in nature, but um, if you look at Section 3104.2, it says that owner-occupied lodging houses with five or greater guest rooms or 10 or fewer total occupants shall be permitted to be constructed in accordance uh, with the International Residential Code. Um, so why I highlighted at the very beginning the different codes we have, you're, you're comparing the International Building Code to the International Residential Code. And clearly, as you're seeing, you know, the larger the unit, you're dealing with different codes. But... Um, but one thing that highlights is it's interesting that under the R1, um, it's units that are primarily uh, people that reside in their full-time residence for more than 183 days in the year. It seems like an arbitrary day, but it's essentially about half of the year. Uh, so, um, so it needs to be more than 50% of the year that somebody needs to be able to live in that to not be considered primarily transient in nature. Uh, you know, you can actually read in section 310.4, it highlights that owner occupancy of the dwelling. Um, so uh, in order for it to be built and be in compliance with the International Residential Code, there is no owner occupancy requirement for lodging houses that are established in compliance with the R3 requirements. Uh, lodging houses tend to be beds and breakfasts. So I had highlighted that this is maybe treated a little bit differently. And, it goes on to say that the facilities under R3 occupancy or even uh, transient housing is generally under the R1 classification. And as I mentioned, that's where you compare you know, primarily transient versus primarily full-time residential. Um, under the R1 classification, um, owner occupants um, are required by definition to be at least uh, be permanent in nature. So why I highlighted that specific part of the code was um, you, if you assume that somebody's living in a building, if you've been to many bed and breakfast, a lot of the times you'll have 
either the owner of the bed and breakfast live at the facility or have somebody there all the time to obviously attend to the people that are, are staying overnight. So, you know, why is that maybe treated a little bit differently? And, and it's interesting how it defines that. It states that, um, I'm going to actually read a quote under 310.2. It says, there is an expectation that occupants are not familiar with the, the building as residents as non-transient non facilities as such as apartment buildings. If occupants are unfamiliar with their surroundings, they may not recognize potential hazards or may be able to use the means of egress effectively. So why I highlighted that is you could say, well, you know, why are we specifically requiring this for conversions? Well, the, the, the big key here is, is if the building hypothetically, and obviously, God forbid, I would not want to see this ever happen, but the building would happen to catch on fire, the, the thought process is, is that um, if people are staying there, they don't know how to get out of there. I'm sure that any hotel or motel you've ever stayed in, there's those charts to say how you get out of the building safely. A lot of times, bed and breakfast. Sorry, sorry. Did you have a question? Oh, no. oh, sorry. But anyway, so typically, you know, you would have an ability to understand how to exit the facility, whereas here, if you have somebody staying on site, as compared to this, just somebody renting a unit, like a lot of times we're having in on these conversions of short-term rental units, it's only the people renting the facility. There's not a full-time person on site all the time to potentially help somebody exit the site um, or exit the facility uh, that, that would be definitely familiar with the building. And, and I'm actually going to come back to that in a moment and, and, and explain why I went over that in excruciating detail. So do forgive me for that. And I, but, um, but one thing to consider is Short-term rental units, if you look at the definition in the zoning code, and this is actually just a, a sample of the list of uses within the zoning ordinance, nightly rentals, as I mentioned, includes short-term rentals. It's permitted in almost all districts within the city. So the only place it's not allowed is in low-density residential areas, uh, business, the business district, as well as industrial districts, which you know, each one of those reasons you can totally understand why the rationale for that is, but the key is, is you look at the inverse, it's allowed in every single one of the other districts. So the question is, is you know, do you specifically want to allow uh, these to continue to happen in these areas? But one interesting thing is, you know, you look at the, the column on the far right hand side, it mentions supplemental use standards. So anytime you have a specific land use, you can have supplemental use standards. Um, and, and obviously here's a map. So you know, those, those three districts, uh, I'll, I'll come back to in a moment, but why I had highlighted the specific use standards is if you go to uh, that link that's on the side of the table, this 94 or 63 E12, um, it highlights this specific section up for lodging. It has A for hotels, B for nightly rentals, and C for timeshares. So B, under nightly rentals, there's only two very specific regulations or requirements that are applied to those specific land uses that are otherwise not applied to other land uses. Where in this case it applies, it says that individual rooms with a single family dwelling unit shall not be permitted. Uh, so to be clear here, our ordinance specifically does not allow uh, that to occur. And then secondly, uh, number two, it shall be permitted within those plan developments which specifically list the use to being allowed. So key here is the city, city officials are within your rights to change these specific land use structures where you're allowed to have these. It's all totally within your prerogative of where you want to have that. So, you know, if we're seeing that maybe specific areas of the city maybe don't fit within wanting to see these short-term rentals, maybe it doesn't make sense. Or if you want to change the specific requirements, it's very easy potentially to just simply change this. I mean, obviously we would want to go through proper public notification, but you know, if you look back at the map, um, you know, the only key areas where you're not allowed to do it is the low, resident, low density residential areas, which you can see highlighted are yellow areas, which is the way I would rationalize that is if you're living in a low density residential neighborhood, it's predominantly places where our lots are larger, uh, you don't have quite as big of densities. Um, these are people that usually want to buy a home and live there permanently. You're not predominantly expected that you're going to have commercial units in and around your home site. So, so the specific ordinance doesn't allow for short-term rentals or nightly rentals in the yellow or the low-density residential areas. Um, so why I highlight that specifically is 
a lot of times what you're happening is when you're having these conversions from homes to short-term rentals, you know, we're not even necessarily seeing when it maybe may or may not be coming properly through finance for a license is whether or not they're actually going in some of these areas that are not allowed. Because you know, one of the big complaints that I've heard numerous times already is that these conversions are just party houses. They're cramming a lot of people into these places and it's, it's very noisy. It's potentially a nuisance to the surrounding neighbors. But then again, you know, obviously, you know, the low density districts are, are the key area here where they're not allowed. I mean, it's certainly, as I mentioned, business and industrial, but those are very small portions within the city. The whole rest of the city is, uh, is allowable uh, for those particular kinds of units. Another key piece, and it potentially is available, is, is this nightly rental uh, tool. And I know that the GIS department, or the GIS folks in IT, uh, they're really good at what they do. And, and we potentially could use the ability to identify, you know, where specifically are these licensing coming through, you know, if we go through more of a digital submission, we can better understand where these concentrations are to understand are they in or close to low-density residential areas, for example. Um, but it does potentially allow a, a tool for the city to use to point people to uh, the proper uh, uh, units that are licensed through the city. So it's not necessarily something that is, is live. It would have to manually be uploaded, but... Uh, you know, maybe through ERP and other programs going coming forward, there's something that could be more of a live uh, product, and we can potentially have that discussion moving forward. But why I highlight that is if you look at some of the online vacation rental platforms, is I, why I highlighted what Ben had said with having 900 units uh, registered. If you look at VRBO, which is a pretty common online vacation rental platform, it quickly comes up and says that there's 300 plus rooms available within the city. Uh, if you manually go through it, and just to key it for, for, a, um, for a standard date, I just looked at the first week of December. Because, you know, we know that during the summertime, most of our units are potentially already going to be reserved. But so you're looking at the first week of December, 497 rooms come up. So, uh, you know, is that corresponding to what, what Ben is saying? Sure. But then you look at Airbnb, and it lists over 1,000. But yet you look at, for example, the 2030 plan, uh, the, the 2030 plan specifically mentioned that there's 16,600 lodger uh, uh, hotel rooms in 201 lodging properties. And why I highlight that is there's a key difference between rooms and licensed facilities. So as you can understand, a motel or a hotel, it could potentially have multiple rooms for rent, but it would be only one license. Um, you know, and then you even look at, uh, for example, the... Taney County Partnership just recently updated their, uh, their housing study, and in their market analysis, they use the product called AirDNA Market Minder. So I don't know if that's similar to the product that, that Ben had just highlighted, but there um, it had highlighted that there were 2,207 units in 2019 and 4,812 units in 2012, or excuse me, 2022. So in a three-year time span, uh, that, that more than increased by 50, that more than doubled how many units it, it highlighted there are, specifically for short-term rentals. So, um, so I, I mainly just wanted to paint the picture today as to, to why um, maybe we're seeing what we're seeing. Um, again, I'm going to highlight that I, I think that a lot of times, I don't know if it's just ignorance, but certainly there's a financial decision to be made that... Um, that if you're going to convert specifically a house that was given a certificate of occupancy for a house, uh, it's not typically designed for uh, guests. So it's not until you want to change the occupancy that that would really come into play. But um, as you would might all understand, that if it was specifically designed for rental units or were designed to be uh, a high occupant uh, facility like a hotel or motel, it would need to automatically apply to those larger standards that I had highlighted earlier. So, um, so it's typically designed, and when we would issue an, the initial building permit, typically it would fall in line automatically with needing to have fire alarm and fire suppression. But I guess the key here is, is because you're specifically seeing, and the question I think that Ben had maybe tried to, to, to start the conversation on was, why is it increasing so much in just the past three, number of years. And I think that if you look at VRBO, you look at Airbnb, those web pages, that's where people are seeing there's there's certainly money to be had to rent out your housing unit. You know, maybe you didn't necessarily 
originally intend on buying a house to use it as a rental unit, but you're seeing that there's obviously money to be made in renting your unit. So people are saying, hey, uh, this is something to be had. And, and I will say, and I'm not going to necessarily bring anybody up by name, but there are many realtors within the city that are saying, buy this house. You can use it as a short-term rental, uh, even though it may or may not comply with code. So you know, there's something that's specifically be said about that. Um, and um, so one thing to, to think about there is, you know, really what, what do we want the vision for the city to be for, uh, going forward? And I know that anytime you have obviously new boards and you have new uh, people making decisions, it's always a good time to reconsider what those visions are. But one thing I wanted to bring up is when you look back at the 2030 plan, uh, there was a, there was a, study that was sent out as part of the study and indicated that um, that 1.6 percent of the people indicated that lodging either motels or hotels was something that people would like to see more of in the future so people are seeing that you know and that actually falls in the top 10 list of the things that people wanted to see and obviously we are seeing that so you know we're moving closer to that desired future within the city but then the second thing is is that one of the questions that was asked of people was which of the following were your biggest concerns about the city today? And one of them was uh, the lack of a variety of housing choices. Now, granted, that goes more towards, um, you know, more workforce housing, for example, which directly contrasts with a lot of what you're seeing in the developing community today. A lot of times what we're seeing coming through the planning office for permits is for specifically for rental units and not for uh, longer term or, or uh, what you call workforce housing. So. And as the market continues to play out and allows people to continue to sell those units, you're going to continue to allow the market to allow the developers to build those kinds of units. So there's definitely a market dynamic going forward. So the question is, do you still want to, to look at the zoning map that we have, allow the land uses to be where they are, or maybe apply certain particular uh, uses or, or standards to that particular land use? And um, so I'm just kind of opening up the question, you know, what is the vision going forward? I don't expect anybody to nail that answer right now. You know, I would love, obviously, your feedback on this. But, you know, I think it's something that we need to continue to look at going forward. But, but to Ben's point is there, there are tools out there that allows us to collect and assess all the units that are basically out of compliance with the code now. Not necessarily the building code, but most likely it would be building code, but more with business licensing. So, you know, when he's saying there's 900 units that are in compliance and there's hypothetically three times that within the city without really knowing that for sure. Um, there's, there's certainly many out there that could potentially be collected. So then the question is, is how do you get them into compliance? And I'll highlight that in, going forward. But then the question is, is the enforcement of that. So, you know, if hypothetically, you know, city staff or you know, as the elected officials that you are, you would find that there are people that are potentially out of compliance. The question is, is what do we do about that? You know, we know for sure there's, there's units out there that are being rented that don't have a license. So do we just turn the key and say, we're going to start enforcing that today? And I'm not here to say that it's not somewhat being enforced now, but there clearly is going to be units in the city now that are not in compliance. So, so when you would potentially make the decision, you know, we're going to focus on this area, um, you know, there's going to have to be a period of time to allow people to decide, do I want to continue to rent my unit? Where do I not want to do that? Do I not come into compliance? What compliance pieces will I have to come and come to deal with? Which is why I had spent so much time talking about fire suppression, for example. But you know, one thing you want to think about is a compliance window. You send them a letter, for example, how much time do you want to allow them to become in compliance? Some of them may elect to not bother to be in compliance, but some may voluntarily do that. But knowing that there are certainly the reason that you, you're seeing the market drive a lot of the residential construction right now to the rentals and not to the long-term housing needs is because the market is allowing those units to be sold. So if that's a key indicator, you know that they're making profit doing that. So you, know, you give them a certain window, do they have enough profit to potentially to come go into compliance? Um, my answer to that would be potentially yes. And then, you know, certainly we want to look, continue to look at public outreach. Certainly, I think this is the first step. You know, obviously, the, there's a lot of people out in the public that don't know, um, you know, that maybe this is even a requirement. And then even another thing to highlight is, you know, do you specifically even consider the conversion of maybe a one-unit residential building that was originally intended 
as a full-time residence to a rental unit, you now consider that automatically less safe than a residential unit because in the city, we do not actually require residential units to be sprinkled unless it's an R4. But, um, you know, with that said, um, you know, the building code official is allowed to make the decision as whether or not uh, that hazard has increased beyond what it was considered as a full-time residential unit. So, you know, could we consider other things, like I mentioned fire egress and looking at other kind of alert systems. So there are certainly ways that we can kind of dig into what specifically we enforce, but uh, you are certainly seeing um, the vast majority of the people that are falling out of the, 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 the compliance piece by the, the simple conversion of a single, what was considered a single family dwelling into a rental unit. And it, typically it's usually only one unit. So do you treat that similarly like you do like a bed and breakfast, which is why I highlighted that. Typically in, with a bed and breakfast, you're not gonna require that to be sprinkled because you potentially have a full-time resident or full-time staff on site at all times. So th there's potentially ways to look at this, but certainly I think it all goes back to the vision and the period of time for enforcement. So first of all, do we, we need to understand how many people are out of compliance. And second of all, just give clear steps as to how to come back into compliance. And then what are the, how many people will that affect and what the, what is the period of time in order to enforce that? And then you can make subsequent decisions as to, well, if you don't meet this deadline, then what do we do with you? So uh, there's many things to consider, but at least wanted to paint the picture as to potentially why it is the way that it is. And, and there are certainly ways that we can maybe address this going forward. So. So, Mark, let me start off by saying I really appreciate the amount of time and effort you're putting into this. This is something that we've talked about for quite a while, and that is let's go back and revisit the codes and see which ones may need some adjustment. So communities ask for that, so thank you very much. Thank you, too, Ben, for your input. You've covered several different um, tentacles to this topic to the enforcement, to the taxes, to the how the city is um, being gobbled up by nightly rentals versus housing. You've covered a lot of topics. I would like to see if I could engage conversation with this board on the specific topic of single family residents requiring a fire sprinkler when they convert to short term rental. Um, I'll share my personal opinions, and I'll be anxious to hear what the board says. Number one, I'm confident, as I think you are, that is a huge reason why some of our owners aren't um, applying for a license. I have no idea what it costs to put in a fire sprinkler system. I know it's a lot. I don't know what a lot is, but it's a lot. I can give you a ballpark if you like. But sure. People are saying it's anywhere between like twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, see, that makes economic sense, right? I'm just being facetious. There's the reason why somebody is not saying, "Hey, I want to conform." I also I want to apply, and I know I've got my fire department in here. It just, for the life of me, it doesn't make sense. I understand the paragraph you read. I'm familiar with their surroundings. For twenty-five or thirty thousand, really, um, a single-family home was built for residential use, and so many um, adults, kids, whatever that unit. I'm sure there's limits on how many people can occupy yes. that structure, right. right? Whether they're living there or spending the night there, right. I would sure like to hear from the board of at a minimum as we move forward down this road i it, it doesn't sit well with me to say here's a physical structure that you can live in and there was something that you read where if you live in it for at least six months it'll be okay right to rent out the rest of it but you have to live in it for, as your primary residence for six months i think that's government hogwash is what i think so Removing the fire suppression system. I mean, all these units are, and I don't know what the rules are, but 
I know Ted is real big on having smoke detectors in everybody's single family home, right? Well, if you have a smoke detector in your single family home and you rent it out for a nightly rental, it provides the same protection as the person there staying for one night or seven nights. Saying all that to say, I'd love to hear the board's opinion on removing the requirement of somebody who owns a single family detached home to not be required to have a fire sprinkler system. In a hotel, you have units next door. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why we need fire suppression. Single family detached home, I struggle with the government mandating that that's a requirement to rent out your home. Any board members have input? Actually, that's, that was the first thing I wrote down. And, and my question was, you have a family home, mom and dad and three kids purchased to live in. They live there five or six years. They decide to move and rent it out. And now it's a nightly rental. And a, a mom and dad comes in with two to four children to rent it. And all of a sudden, there needs to be a fire sprinkler system. It's still a mom and dad and two or three kids. Stand, I, 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 I mean... Ted's going to be mad for, you know, for us saying this maybe, but I don't get it either. Yeah, well, Ted won't be asked to speak, so okay. feel, feel freely. <laughs> Ruth, what's your two cents? My two cents. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. If we're only going to allow, right now, I have a lot of questions. If we're only going to allow it in um, MDR and high density, medium density, high density, the single family really wouldn't come into play. However, if it was allowed in single family, low density, um, I wouldn't want the house next door to me being rented out short term. They're gonna, I think that it should have to have a fire suppression. I don't want my house to catch on fire because we've got people that are renting next door that really aren't gonna treat it like if it was their own home if they're coming in for short-term rentals. We're talking short-term rentals, correct? Yeah, so they're treated a little bit differently than the than I would treat my own home. I mean, I would treat any home with respect, but unfortunately that's not the case for the majority of people, especially people that just go to party and really don't, you know, they're just thinking of having fun. They're not thinking of the life safety issues. So I am not in support of not requiring that. Thank you. Cody? <clears throat> well, I think, I think you, there's kind of two valid points here, right? I mean, on the one hand, why is the home any less safe now? But I think, I think to Ruth's point also, how much is this really happening if that particular style of home is in the area that's zoned where that use isn't allowed? So it seems to me, and, and I don't have anything, any actual facts to, to back this up, but it seems to me like if there's a thousand or more units that aren't in compliance, I would guess that the single family detached home is not the issue. In other words, the sprinkler system causing people to not comply, it seems to me like that's, that's maybe a number of them, but not a very significant number. I don't know if that's where we, where we focus our efforts on this particular issue, I guess, is where I was kind of sitting here thinking about it. So, yes, I, I, I fully get what you guys are saying. That house is, is no less safe now necessarily because it's gone from you know, full-time residence to short-term rental. But I think to your point is how much is, this, how much is this one particular property really the issue? In the grand scheme of the nightly rental properties, is the single-family residence really our biggest issue? So I guess that's my two cents is maybe this is uh, was not. That, <laughs> was that a question? Or a, I was going to say, you well, sound just, just like a lawyer. Right? <laughs> I mean, is that true, though? Is it not? Is that I'm, probably the least of our concerns? Well, but even if it is the least, I know there's many things to address. And if it, even if this was a small one, um, because I'll, I mean, I saw a dozen different topics in here. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, but for this one specific topic, do you have a yes or no answer? <laughs> 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 Maybe 
Here, if I maybe. could maybe give a little <laughs> bit of, of more background for you. Like you just said, this is one spoke of a very big wheel. Yes. And so I think it's very valid to bring up the fire suppression question because it's, it's a very valid one, right, for a policy board to, to be able to, to steer us in the right direction. But, you know, be, there are other alternatives that we will bring before you in a package that would say may, maybe require extra fire suppression or more regular fire inspections, whatever it might be. We've got a whole plethora of different sure. ideas that we can bring to you to help maybe make up for not requiring sprinklers if that's the direction you go. As a former home builder, um, Ted and I have gone round and round on this one, but you know, I wasn't in favor of requiring sprinklers either just because it's just so cost prohibitive. And, and not just in new construction, but now we're talking about retrofitting homes. And really, what's the realistic idea that anybody would do that? So you have to look at the practicality of the suggestions that we're looking to make. So I just want to assure everybody that you know I appreciate hearing from the rest of the board on the fire suppression uh, and the sprinkler issue. But we're just trying to kind of get a general sense and a navigation from you. What direction do you want us to head? We have a responsibility to collect all the revenues that are due to the taxpayers of Branson. We've got a responsibility of equity and fairness to motel, hotel owners, other nightly rental folks who are paying the appropriate yep. payments back to the city that help support the services. There's conversations that'll be had about the number of inspections, the types of inspections, how often the inspections, Maybe do we have a separate zoning ordinance related just to nightly rentals? Yep. So we're not trying to jam a square peg into a round hole and call them a bed and breakfast or whatever. So there's so many different things here that we, we would need 10 study sessions to go over every spoke of the wheel with you. But if we can get a kind of just the general gist of do you find the direction we're heading to be fair and appropriate and to be able to bring you ideas to consider on how to modernize our zoning codes and license codes in order to address these shortfalls that have happened just as the market has transpired the way it has. Yeah. I think we're on the right path for sure. Um, for sure. Um, Chuck, what's your thoughts on the how, converting a house to a nightly rental with fire suppression? How would a single family home be different for a nightly rental as opposed to a yearly lease? The requirements? It would it would be year. it would be in a different code. It would be under a long term rental, which would not require a fire sprinkler system, but being a short term rental does require it. I don't know. I'd like to hear from Ted. I mean, doesn't well, that on. doesn't that just deter deter people from getting the license and? <laughs> Yeah. Renting it out anyhow and just not submitting the money. I mean, yeah. and if like, well, I ain't spending forty thousand dollars for that, just rent it out and don't tell nobody. Well, and I think that's obviously the situation that we're in is that people aren't telling. And you know, what we're looking at, I think the bigger picture of it is like, how do we capture that revenue that this is happening anyway? How do we do it? And again, it's just one spoke of the wheel of you know, how are we going to do that? And I think you know, the, the path that we're headed, I think, is, you know, in the right direction. Um, but I think it, call, it boils back to, like, what system are we going to use to identify where those revenues are? And as we're identifying where the revenues are, we're implementing at the same time, like walking and chewing gum at the same time, <laughs> what are going to be the requirements moving forward? So that if someone does have that single-family home that's a nightly rental you know, we're going to make that decision like, okay, if you're going to continue this, one, you have to pay the tourism tax, but the other thing is you have to do fire suppression or, or extra fire suppression if it's not a sprinkler system. But, you know, at the end of the day, we have to look at, like, what are the, the life safety issues? And I think that's, you know, where it kind of gets a little bit cloud, cloud, clouded is that, Long term, and, and I kind of agree with Ruth, is like the long term state, people have a little more conscientiousness of living. When you're in a short term, i.e. nightly rentals or weekly rentals, you don't have that same conscious, conscientiousness that you have when you're at your home. Sure. So you're kind of a little more relaxed and there's a little more opportunity for things to run amok or, or things to happen. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, that's where that extra... Um, either, again, fire suppression or extra suppression would come in. And I think that's how the delineation, because even with Clay said, you know, uh, a mom, dad, and three kids um, owning the home, 
well, the nightly rental, mom, dad, three kids, what's different? Well, nothing's different in the people, but it's, 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 it's kind of, again, where their mind is. They're on vacation. They're not, you know, thinking about all the other mundane things that they think about when they're at home. And I think that's where, um, where we have to come in and regulate those things. So um, not for or against. I just want to make sure that what we do is, um, is smart and it's got to be economical for people. I mean, if, it, if, if we're going to allow for nightly rentals, like we don't want to price someone out of it just because, you know, it, it's $50,000 for a sprinkler system. Um, could it be a deterrent? Sure. Which, you know, I think in some instances, some residents would want that because, you know, it's kind of like not in my neighborhood, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah, but yeah. that's a whole other issue. That's yeah, a, yeah and that's then, a different. Yeah, that's and a different then they're going to do it anyhow. And I totally agree with Ruth's point that people are not going to treat it the same if yeah. they're just there and for a few. I totally agree with that. So, big picture, I think you guys are on the right track. If there was some suggestions, Kathy, for example, maybe there's extra fire extinguishers required, or so, Ted shaking his head no. Well, we can come up with a whole array, a yeah. smorgasbord for you all to be able to right. look at yeah. and evaluate, and we're not going to come up with the answers yeah. right here tonight. Yeah. It wouldn't be appropriate. Um, and so I think just so that we have, we wanted to lay out what the challenges are, that this is indeed a huge rock. And so when we talk about those big policy challenges or issues that we're struggling with internally, this is a great big one because yeah. there's so many spokes to it. So. Yeah. Um, I keep using wheels and rocks interchangeably <laughs> here today, but you get the drift of what I'm trying to say. But we'll bring a lot of those ideas back to you all again, obviously. We want to look at comparative communities across the country, say Pigeon Forge, Wisconsin Dells, Myrtle yeah. Beach. Look at what those tourism destination communities are doing too, because sure. they're going through the same thing. Yep. Uh, but really, it's, it's about we want to do the right thing to protect public health, safety, and of course the coffers of the city as well, but we're not interested in putting people out of business or pricing this out of their reach. That's not our goal. We just wanna be fair and make sure we protect public health and safety. Yep. Ben, you had something? The only thing I would add to what Kathy's talking about is database decision making, right? Yes. So back to what Cody said, my hope out of the RFP is to actually gather the data that gives you how pronounced is a certain issue. It may not be that big an issue. It may be onesie twosies. It just all depends. It all it's going to be based on decisions. So as we or data, as we get that information back, we bring it back to you, or we bring it back to the management team, and we can start we can start uh, designing those workshops okay. and have that kind of discussion. We're yeah. making now. Yeah. So Kathy, if you would, would you help us expedite? Ben's needing a green light to at least go find companies that do this. Yeah. Right. Yes, I mean, I, I, I'm green. Let's go. Do you, so, are you okay just at least saying, you know what, at least go find the companies that can provide information? Are we okay with the nod on that? Thank Good. you. Hillary? Appreciate that. Good? Good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, any reports from the aldermen? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this study session. I move it. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. We will reconvene at 6 o'clock.